I think we can start. Thank you everybody for being here. It is really my great pleasure today to introduce uh, our fourth installment of the Tetra Lectures. And um, I'm very, very happy to have with us today Professor Gitsi Van, who is a Professor Emerita of History at the University of Kansas Center for Global International Studies. And after having studied classics and ancient history at Tel Aviv and Yale, uh, Professor Sivan obtained a PhD at Columbia University with a thesis on early Visigoths under the supervision of Alan Cameron. And besides working in Lawrence, Kansas, she also has been an associate professor at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And she's also a co-founder of the international series of conference Shifting Frontiers in Late Antiquity. Hagit Sivan is an international leading expert in late antiquity world in general and ancient Judaism. And her research, research interests have always been wide and bridging gap between two fields, classics and late antiquity on the one hand and rabbinic literature on the other. At the same time though, uh, another point of interest also gaining critical importance in her work and that is women in ancient times. And again, her attention has been devoted to both women in the Bible and women and empress in late antiquity. These interests are reflected in the range of books that she wrote, of which I will only mention the book uh, Gala Placidia, The Last Roman Empress, 2011, or Between Woman, Man and God, A New Interpretation of Ten Commandments, 2004, and Dina's Daughters, Gender and Judaism from the Bible to Late Antiquity, 2002, but also books uh, Asonius of Bordeaux, Genesis of a Gallic Aristocracy, Aristocracy 1993, or um, Palestine in Late Antiquity, 2008. More recently, she also turned to another topic that is Jewish childhood in antiquity. And uh, her studies on this matter resulted, for instance, in the book Jewish, Ch Jewish Childhood in the Roman World, 2018. Today, Professor Sivan will deliver a lecture entitled Why Not Teach Girls Greek and Torah? Rabbinic Views on the Transmission of Knowledge from Fathers to Daughters in Late Antiquity. Professor, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have to start with an apology and a confession. The apology is, if you hear background noises, there are not bombing. I mean, I am in Tel Aviv, but somebody I think is cutting a tree and they decided to cut the tree right now. So I apologize. <laughs> this is what happens when you live in a, so to speak, quiet neighborhood in Tel Aviv. Uh, so I apologize. And the confession is, that I really do not like Zoom. I know it's very old fashioned, it's very non-digital, but I don't like Zoom. That is to say, I like to listen because I can be in my pajama, I can be washing dishes, I can be cooking, who cares? Nobody sees me. But when I have to give a lecture, I really miss my audience. It's, it's as though I'm talking to myself. So I'm going to ask every one of the wonderful people who are here to tell me about themselves. I'm interested in what are your research interests and if you happen to have any exposure to rabbinic literature. So if you don't mind sharing with me just a little bit about yourself, I would appreciate that. Georgia, would you start? Of course. Yeah, Thank you. I'm Thank a you. PhD student at Ghent University and Paris Bersche, and I mainly work on Syriac and Greek literature. So no, I don't often come across rabbinic literature. And that's what's in particular. Me. What's your interest in particular? Um, I'm working on Syriac historiographical excerpts. Oh, I'm sorry, on what? Historiographical excerpts and florileja. So yeah, history in Syriac. Oh, wonderful. OK. Yeah. Dan. Um, I'm uh, Dan Batovic and I'm a postdoc at Kerry Leuven and I work on ancient translations of early Christian literature. Um, and um, to my shame, the um, connection with um, rabbinic literature is very slim. And translation into what languages? Um, at the moment, mostly on Syriac, but a bit of Armenian and Coptic. Yeah, great. Sabrina. <laughs> Hi, Hagit. Hi there. <laughs> I'm also in Tel Aviv right now, but I'm officially also a sort of postdoc at Kai Leuven. 
and I do work a little bit with rabbinics. And in fact, I will work a little bit even more with rabbinics. I'm, um, you know, I work on late antique scholarship, especially in the Christian world. And my current project is in, on Pamphilus of Caesarea. Oh. But I have another new project in which I'm going to look at the significance of writing in one's own hand. And for that, I will try to delve a little more into the rabbinic stuff. And um, even I would like very much to do sort of a comparative uh, analysis a little bit with the Christian sources. Great. Sounds great. Thank you. Andy. Andy can speak. Some, yeah. some of our colleagues will not be able to speak. Andy is no in problem. a group of okay. students. Can like somebody some talk for him? Can you tell us what he's uh, working on? I will in a second until Yarun, you're the fact next on my screen, he hit me. Okay. Hello. So um... it... <laughs> long hey, time no <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll well, you already know a little bit about me, but I'll just tell you briefly what I'm working on these days, and that is mm -hmm. uh, digitizing and revising the prosopography of the late Roman Empire volume two. So you'll be happy to note that the entry that I'm currently working on is Flavius Arsenius Tree, the native of Palestine and Skitopolis, the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yes, it's so lovely to see you. I actually was, well, maybe we'll chat afterwards because yeah. <laughs> I actually was running into your work. I'm, I'm, I forgot to mention, and I did mention to Georgia, but my most recent interest is North Africa. Ah, so, okay. Yes. <laughs> so, Good. yeah, so we'll see. All right, Bess, Bosco, please. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Boshko. I am uh, work uh, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Orthodox Theological Faculty. Uh, I am working on uh, Syriac, um, uh, Syriac uh, texts, fourth uh, to sixth uh, century. Uh, re uh, recently, I started uh, working uh, on uh, other uh, Aramaic uh, uh, dialects. Uh, uh, now I am working on um, uh, Jewish uh, letters from uh, Elephantina. Uh, oh, from wow. Fifth, but you're going uh, back, century, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> fifth century uh, BC. Right. And uh -huh. I think that's all. <laughs> and I'm, oh, trying, wonderful. Uh, I'm trying to translate uh, as much as uh, possible from uh, Syria, Karamaic uh, into, Ser into Serbian. And, oh, wonderful. Uh, wow. <laughs> Great. Okay. Alicia. Uh, hello. I hello. am uh, an alumni of KU Leuven, but now I just uh, had my doctoral defense at the University of Zurich on uh, First Corinthians uh, chapter 14, Molière Tatset in Ecclesia. And uh, I uh, do not have much to do with rabbinic uh, things, but uh, my interest at least up to, until now has been about women in, in early Christianity. Right now, I, I have nothing to do. Basically, I will start uh, some work at University of Regensburg this uh, in a couple of months, actually. But I am still thinking uh, what to do, like what to research, if, if I still have interest in women <laughs> or, or maybe I will find some other interest. We'll, we'll talk about it. There's, there's still a lot of work to do. So, Stefani? Yes. I, yes. I Hello. Got, You're driving. I, I can't it. believe it. <laughs> I got stuck in the traffic jam of Tel Aviv. <laughs> so, I am from uh, Barilan University. I worked for my PhD on Tertullian. I compared uh, the Maseret of Dazara of the Mishnah with uh, Tertullian's uh, De Idolatria. And now I'm working uh, more generally on the relationships between uh, Greeks, Romans, and uh, Jews in antiquity. So what is your connection with Ghent, with the university then, with this group? Um, I don't know. I just uh, got a message by email and I registered. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. The marvels of the digital world. Okay, Luis. Yes. Luis, I'm sorry. Thank you. Be careful. <laughs> Driving here is not easy. Luis? Yes, hello. Hello, Luis. Uh, yes, hello. Do, do not have I hope any you're not driving. 
No, <laughs> I also do not have any connections to to live and accept uh, some conferences and things like that. So I knew I know of quite a few people who were here. Um, I'm my first contact with rabbinic literature were Nicolas Delange's reading groups, but mm -hmm. I was wow. not good enough at it. So that was one thing and quite completely different because I. I'm a lecturer in classics in Brazil, Sao Paulo, but my Wonderful. research is about church councils. I stumbled on Clifford Andos and others' comparisons about imperial identity in Christian and rabbinic sources, so I tried to pursue that, uh, but I didn't go much, very far. And nowadays, my main interest in rabbinic literature in general is uh, mainly about similarities in uh, exegesis and things like that, not so much in Palestine, but more the Mesopotamian material, uh, because I'm looking a bit about on the development of Christianity in the fourth and fifth century in in yeah, Persian, Iran. So, so, oh, wonderful. That's, 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 that's a very good subject. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. We'll have, <laughs> I can see, do you realize now what a pity it is that we are on Zoom? Because I think each one of us could really, really have a wonderful long conversation. So, all right, let's see. Ali? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. So yeah, I'm Ali Agai. Yeah, nice to see you all. I nice always participate by him, but uh, yeah. So um, I'm at the moment research, research associate in uh, Paderborn University. I, I did Islamic studies and I'm doing still Islamic studies. My main interest is uh, Quranic studies and uh, the uh, intertextual connection between between the uh, the Quranic traditions and uh, and the rabbinic tradition. I participated a lot um, in Professor Tal Ilan's uh, lectures in in FU Berlin, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot about uh, rabbinic tradition from her. I'm still in contact with her, but uh, she's retired unfortunately. So, um, but um, yeah, that's my main uh, concentration. Yeah, to uh, to do. But my my project is and still working on is to uh, to connect the um, early Islamic uh, exegetical tradition on the Quran with the rabbinic tradition, which we have a lot of common common narratives wow. and common motifs. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. It's fascinating. All right, Marie. Marie Lo. <laughs> yeah, it's the same as Stephanie. Basically, I I'm not part of the group, but I saw it by email. Uh, so I'm a master's student at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm working on um, the Jewish epitaphs for children in the Jewish catacombs of Rome. Oh, so wonderful. I oh. read your book about Jewish children, obviously, and yeah, and I think I will be working more on rabbinics uh, in the next years. And yeah, and I'm also part of a reading group of um, Professor Nicolas Delange because I was in Cambridge last year. Wonderful, goodness. Yes, great, thank you. So we go to you, Doreen and Andrew. Hello. I yes. think I lost Andrew. Did you, I'm you here. <laughs> yeah. Where are you? <laughs> I'm in Oxford. I'm doing my detail here. I'm walking home right now. I work on Syriac literature and specifically the early accounts of Mary's Dormition. Fantastic. Yes. Yes. That, that's a great topic. Okay. Are you, are you driving or cycling or what? Or walking? Walking. walking. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Brett. Hi. <laughs> I am not yes. sure. Brett, yeah. Uh, he wrote it in the chat. He apologizes okay. for not being able to take control of the microphone. Uh, to take the okay. microphone, sorry. I study at the Catholic Theological Faculty at the Uni uh, Salzburg at an MA level, and I'm interested in Syriac literature and contemporary Syriac Christian communities. I've studied some Hebrew and other Aramaic dialects, but I have only really dipped my toe into Midrash. Wonderful. Super. Yeah. And did we have uh, Armin? As well, she can speak. Uh, she's working on medieval uh, Armenian literature, biblical commentaries, theological and philosophical texts. Oh, gosh, wonderful. And then you, you, lovely. Have we covered everybody? Oh, I can um, introduce briefly Andy, who is okay. a Newton International Fellow at the University of Oxford, and mm -hmm. he's been working on Syriac historiography. 
and in identity formation in the past, but his current project, uh, project focuses on polemics between Syriac and Armenian Christians in the 11th and 12th centuries. He's just finishing his second book, which Brilliant. is a biography of Jacob of Seruch, uh, Syriac oh, yeah. antique. Jacob of Seruch, yeah. yeah, of course, very important. That's the one wow. of the 16th century. That's yes, fantastic. So I'm basically, since you all probably know so much more than I do, maybe at this point I should say goodbye, but <laughs> all right. And so um, so um, uh, thank you um, so very much. It's, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure. And I said, it's a, it's a pity that I cannot and you cannot, we cannot sit around the same table, have coffee together, go for dinner and really talk about uh, what interests you because there's a lot of intersection there. I can see a lot of overlapping and, and really benefiting from what you've done and a little bit from what I've done. I should probably tell you that I got to rabbinic through the back door, which basically means that I am not trained in rabbinics uh, and I did not sit at the feet of a great Talmudist scholar for the last 40 years, um, but I became convinced that you cannot understand truly understand the, uh, what Peter Brown called the world of late antiquity without looking at its many aspects as possible and particularly at the um, interaction between Judaism, Christianity, paganism, and later on Islam. And in order to do that, um, the problem that we are facing in the contemporary academy is that we don't know all the languages necessary. And so we end up as specialists of Egypt because we happen to know, uh, to be able to read the Maltic, we know Coptic. We end up as a Syriac scholars, we end up as Armenian scholars. And the only way we can work is really by talking to one another, to really learn from one another. So the topic um, uh, I picked for today is a very strange topic because quite honestly, when I did the research, I did not realize that the topic that belongs to the third century, fourth century, fifth century would be so contemporary. And that is actually in a way frightening that the questions of accessibility of education to girls is still with us. So very often we happily deal with very dead people. So we don't worry about them, but these particular issues not only have not left us, but they're still very much with us. So the title as you have it is basically, why not teach Jewish girls Torah and Greek? And specifically, I'm interested in questions like who is to teach and who is to learn? So let me begin um, a celebrated rabbinic saying inserted into the Talmudic tractate devoted to the intricacies of getting engaged, what we call betrothal, namely to bot, enumerates recommendations that shape generational roles. Jewish fathers are responsible for circumcising and redeeming their sons, for teaching them Torah and trade, finding them a wife, and according to Rabbi Akiva, also for teaching sons how to swim as commandments, mitzvot, binding fathers to son, these must be discharged and accepted only by men. Moreover, they're mutually binding fathers to sons and sons to fathers. Such in a nutshell is the ideology that undergirds an all male father to son chain of transmission of all knowledge necessary to live like a rabbinically approved Jew in late antiquity. There are no parallels. There are no parallel recommendations relating to the transmission of either Torah or trade skills from fathers to daughters, nor for that matter, from mothers to daughters. So obviously I'm looking at a change of transmission of knowledge. Yet two famous rabbis dared to challenge the entrenched chains of cross-generational transmission of religious and secular knowledge. The one proposing to teach daughters Torah, the other to teach them Greek. Each provoked harsh criticism and even ridicule. By the way, nothing is new regarding to what's happening now in Israel. 
none of these seemingly progressive proposals was formally adopted. Not only did opposition instantly prevail, but the objections remained in force for generations, empowering generational exclusion of females from the type of religious knowledge transmitted exclusively via males. In what follows, I analyze these proposals. So something interesting. Why they were deemed to break with tradition and why they ignited the ire of the rabbinic establishment. I examined their implications in the context in which they were articulated, the strategies adopted by their critics and how both sides reflect religious and social concerns. My point of departure hinges on an assumed distinction between educating females versus their educability. I argue that opposition to extending education to girls was not based on their educability. In other words, the ability to be educated, which at least in theory was never denied, but on the drive to construct walls, mental, psychological, and physical around femininity in order to ensure the viability and continuity of gender distinctions. So why not teach daughters Torah? In the spaces where rabbinic spa sages operated in late antiquity, ample room was made for intellectual paternity and the transmission of religious knowledge from rabbis to disciples. The exclusive circles where the finer points of biblical laws were discussed and dissected, reformulated and reorganized, produced exceptionally detailed manuals in Hebrew and Aramaic relating to femaleness, none apparently meant to be read, learned, or discussed by girls. These have come down to us in the shape of an entire Mishnahic and Talmudic order, Seder, entitled women, Nashim. In other words, we have a significant part of the Mishnah and, of course, the Talmud basically related to women, comprising no less than seven tractates. I know of no comparable compilation aspiring to regulate the female body and mind so comprehensively in antiquity. And this is an aspect that is interesting because uh, you really have to sort of to be uh, introduced to rabbinic writings, but the, that it, the comparison does stand. In other words, I truly do not know of any compilation so comprehensive that is devoted to all everything to do with the female body and also female mind in antiquity. It's truly unusual. Individual tractates within the order of women, as it now stands, follow the female life cycle in somewhat inverse order. From leveret marriage, in other words, you start with your um, sister-in-law, then you go to marriage contracts, you go from vows to abstention and asceticism, and from suspected adulteress to divorce and betrothal. Again, the order is very odd, but extremely uh, interesting. The prominence accorded to cases involving women suspected of adultery, sota, is striking. It is precisely within the context of rabbinic reflections on the biblical ritual designed to find out adulteress, to establish the guilt or the innocence of a woman suspected of adultery, that the proposal to include daughters as recipients of religious knowledge was raised. And I think it's extremely interesting, by the way, that um, to look at the context in which rabbinic discussions take place. Now, of course, to make a long story short, the, the, the huge debate on the historicity, if any, of Talmudic debates is one huge subject relating to rabbinic studies. But the uh, study of the context in which specific saints were raised, I think, really lags behind. The usual modus operandi of rabbinic scholars is to obviously lift a relevant saying here and there uh, in order to build the case. Um, I think that there is merit in, in, in regarding and analyzing the context in which such sayings are actually raised or in which opinions are raised and discussed. 
rabbinic elaboration of the ordeal of the suspected adulteress, also known as the ordeal of the bitter water, had to come to terms with several aspects of the biblical guidelines that no longer applied. The Bible and course, the ritual in the temple, where a mixture of holy water and temple soil is prepared by a priest for the suspected adulteress. The entire ritual is triggered by what the Hebrew Bible calls a spirit of husbandly jealousy. By the time the Mishnah, the Tosefta, and the Palestinian Talmud were redacted between 200 and 400 CE, respectively, the temple had been gone, Jerusalem itself had been closed to all Jews. Consequently, husbands suspecting the wives of infidelity had to follow a legal procedure that perforce dispensed with temple, temple priests, sacrifice, sacred soil, and holy water. Whether the result, a comprehensive, comprehensive rabbinic guide to suspected wifely adultery, was a pure literary exercise of the intricacies of seduction, as has been claimed, or more likely, as I think, an attempt to provide alternative non-temple binding procedures is an open question. The tractate Sota, suspected adulteress, contains rules and proposals relating to the biblical ritual and its updated version. It provides minute details relating to every step of the ritual and its aftermath, from an initial accusation launched by a suspicious husband to the effects of, the, of drinking the water believed to reveal the concealed. Throughout the public ceremony, the only words allowed to the woman are amen, amen, presumably corroborating that she had understood the full import of the menacing curses that the priest chanted in public. The rabbis insisted that these ritualistic curses be said in a language that she could follow. Once the woman is forced to drink the bitter water, she experiences seizure-like symptoms. As described in the Mishnah Sota 3.4, no sooner she drinks that her face turns green, her eyes bulge, and her veins swell. They clamor, get her away, get her away, lest she defiles the temple court. If she possesses any merit, zhut, it stands in her favor. Some merit postpones the penalty by a year. Some merit postpones the penalty by two years. Some merit postpones by three years. At the conclusion of this ekphrasis of horror, the rabbis raise a question. Does the suspected adulteress may, after all, possess merit points which may postpone so dire a dying? Although the term merit features prominently and repeatedly in this unattributed addition to the discussion, there is no explanation of what merit is. Instead, Ben Azai, a famous rabbinic sage of the early second century, is said to, have to make the following proposition. A man is obligated to teach his daughter Torah so that if she were to drink the bitter water, she should know that merit suspense. This sweeping dictum is puzzling. Did Ben Azai allude to a continuous acquisition of Torah learning, a lifelong pursuit in rabbinic orbits, as the penalty postponent marriage? Were fathers to teach daughters only relevant Torah sections so as to warn them of potential adultery? Did Ben Azai imply that just as paternal transmission of religious rules to sons prompts profound awareness of Torah commandments, the same would work for daughters, particularly with regard to the implications of the seventh commandment? thou shall not commit adultery. Ben Azai's attempt to disrupt the vaunted tradition of paternal transmission of religious knowledge solely to sons elicited instant objections. Rabbi Eliezer compared the teaching of Torah to daughters with teaching girls to scorn tradition altogether. Not only would Torah mastery not promote female virtue, rather, it was bound to foster immorality. Nowhere it is stated what the Torah is likely to what in the Torah is likely to promote female promiscuity. 
Eliezer's dismissal of Ben Azai implies that the idyllic domestic environment in which females are bred to breed and to be chaste wives and mothers would harbor instead potential adulteresses. The deliberate parallel of sacred law, Torah, and immorality, Tiflut, meant to belittle the transmission of Torah along unconventional lines in an unconventional space. Eliezer is followed by close associate Rabbi Joshua, who claims that all women prefer sex to abstinence, implying that Eliezer's dictum had been a foregone conclusion. And here is what he, say, what he says is still in the Mishnah Sota 3.4. Rabbi Joshua says, a woman prefers a single measure and of chastity and nine measures of sexual indulgence to nine measures of continence. He used to say, a foolish pietist, a cunning rogue, a female ascetic, and wounds inflicted by separatists usher the destruction of the world. This is, by the way, one of the strange sayings which I have not yet seen any convincing exegesis of. So the chosen terms here, tiflut and prishud, immorality and renunciation, abstinence, ostensibly denote stark oppositions, while the very sound confirms paradoxically an intimate association. To lend substance to the speculation about the nature of the feminine, as though women prefer sex nine times to chastity one time, Joshua produces a list of categories of humans whose behavior is anything but laudatory, among whom there is one feminine category, an ascetic woman. Without further ado, the debate then reverts to the question of merit and how it contributes to the alleviation of the post-drinking impact. Here two contradictory opinions are presented ranging from dismissal of the relevant of relevance of merit to its direct relevance to the outcome of the ordeal. Within the social linguistics religious framework in which these rabbinic dis discussions were formulated and recorded, the issue of transmitting Torah to daughters has had far reaching implications. The Torah is the core of Jewish identity it is also accessible solely to those who master its language, Hebrew, the language of holiness or the holy language, the Shon Kodesh. Although theologically, Hebrew occupied a place of supreme privilege, it had to share the communication stage with Aramaic, Greek, and a host of other languages practiced in late ancient Palestine and indeed throughout the Jewish diaspora. The ban on teaching daughters Torah ascribed to Eliezer signaled a double banning for females from holy text and from holy language. What then about teaching daughters to Greek? Can Greek replace Torah in the transmission of knowledge from fathers to daughters? So let us look at the ornamental value of teaching daughters Greek. According to the same Mishnah, the words that the priests intoned in the presence of the suspected adulteress had to be said in the language that she could understand. The rabbis recorded in the Palestinian Talmud pondered this rule, some surmising that a woman's ritualistic amen, amen, made little sense if she had not understood the curses of the priest. Others believed that there was no need for translation since presumably a suspected adulteress would somehow gauge the essence of the priestly menacing words. Did women talk among themselves about rituals to which they could be subjected? We know very little about intergenerational and cross-generational transmission of knowledge in the bubbles of silence encircling the feminine in antiquity. Rabbinic sources rarely provide insights into inner women communications or into the formal or informal transmission of vital religious knowledge, such as rules relating to menstruation. This was important because menstruation, for example, entailed impurity and the temporary removal of the female body from the household. There are instances in which rabbis speak to women and vice versa. 
none implying difficulties of language communication. The rabbinic injunction mandating males to maintain their distance from females explains the, that con, why conversations between mothers and daughters took place in seclusion. None was recorded in the vast rabbinic corpuses of late antiquity. Discussions of language usage in the rabbinic corpus ignored gender. As far as the rabbis were concerned, as well as contemporary scholars of rabbinics, there was no woman's language. The question of languages in Roman Palestine is not a new or idle. It has occupied considerable space in rabbinic discourse. In the multilinguistic society of Roman Palestine, biblical Hebrew would have been all but inaccessible to females and it seems to many other Jews in the land of Israel. Little wonder that besides behooving fathers to teach their sons Torah, the rabbis insisted on teaching children the holy language, namely Hebrew from infancy. That this injunction remained aspirational rather than practical may be gauged from countless rules relating to Torah translations and to the use of languages other than Hebrew, even in the synagogue. Indeed, Greek was widely used in Jewish communities throughout Palestine and the diaspora. As Saul Lieberman had demonstrated decades ago, Greek formed an integral aspect of Jewish life in spite of repeated rabbinic recommendations forbidding the teaching of Greek to Jewish boys. Inscriptions likewise point to a multilingual society. In synagogue, like those in Caesarea Maritima, where even foundational prayers like the Shema could and were said in Greek, sermons quoting biblical verses were accompanied by Greek translations. Moreover, about one third of synagogue inscriptions hailing from Roman Palestine were in Greek, some poorly composed and clumsily in Greek, suggesting that Greek, perhaps rudimentary, was known even among the so-called lower classes. Jewish fathers were expected to teach their sons Torah and Hebrew, but not their daughters. In a strange parallel and notable rabbinic authority, Rabbi Abahu of Caesarea proposed teaching girls Greek. Here too, the recommendation appears to have provoked reservations. Nor were these aimed solely at fathers willing and able to teach daughters Greek. Rabbinic opposition to teaching sons Greek has become an underlying theme of rabbinic attitudes to non-Jewish cultures. Knowledge of the Greek language opened a door not only to classical Greek paideia, but also to communications with elevated circles of the local ruling class. A temporary banning of teaching Greek to children during times of open hostilities to Rome metamorphosized into a permanent ban on the grounds that Greek provides a tool of treachery. Knowledge of Greek, the rabbis contended, risk disclosures considered treacherous to Jewish causes. It is precisely this link between things Greek and treachery that is used in the Babylonian Talmud to illustrate its potential disastrous effect. So just imagine that you are learning Russian and, and, and you are accused of uh, trying to pass information to Putin. It is probably the exact same frame of mind that teaching children the language of the quote unquote enemy can breed um, treachery. Um, I'm afraid that this kind of um, cultural framework uh, is not confined to um, late antiquity. The proposal to teach daughters Greek appears three times in the Palestinian Talmud where it is always ascribed to Rabbi Abahu of Caesarea. Once it appears in an attracted entitled Pea, which means the corner of fields left to the poor to glean. Once in the context of a discussion of the kind of conduct that can have no access, such as charity, Torah learning, and honoring one's parents. Another time, a doublet of that particular reference, the proposal is embedded in a contracted on suspected adultery, where we talked about it. And the third time, the, uh, uh, the suggestion to teach girls Torah appears in, uh, includes in the uh, discussion of activities forbidden during the Sabbath. So um, here is how it sounds. Ju Rabbi Joshua was asked, should a man teach his son Greek? He said, oh yeah, he should, he can do that. 
at, the, at an hour that in, is neither day nor night. As it is written in the Bible, you shall meditate about it, namely the Torah, day and night. Which basically means <laughs> that, yes, you can teach your son Greek when it's neither day or night. The answer is clearly no, never. On this account, then, one cannot teach his son a life skill as well. In other words, one rabbi says, if, he, if, he, if a man cannot teach his son Greek either by day or by night, how about on the same, by the same logic, no man can teach his son a trade, basically how to survive, how to have a life skill. Rabbi Ishmael said, choose life. Yeah, one should actually teach his son to make a living. This means a craft. Rabbi Abba, son of Hia, and Rabbi Hia said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Greek was forbidden because of informers. Rabbi Abba Hu said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, a man may teach his daughter Greek because it is an ornament for her. Upon hearing this, Shimon Bar Abba said, because Abba Hu wants to teach his daughters Greek, he attributes this dispensation to Rabbi Yochanan. Abba Hu said, May it befall me if I have not heard it from the very mouth of Rabbi Yochanan. So this is a lovely way in which uh, the, um, the Palestinian Talmud coaches the discussion regarding teaching Greek to sons and teaching Greek to daughters, connecting it with the uh, injunctions that I mentioned at the very beginning, that every man must teach his son Torah, and a craft, and find him a woman, find him a woman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the answer to the question of teaching sons Greek is uncompromisingly negative and cunningly couched. If Torah is to be studied day and night, as the Bible enjoins, there's clearly no time left for anything else. Rabbi Ishmael, however, takes this argument to its illogical conclusion, namely that besides Torah, nothing can be taught at any time, including vital life skills. If for whatever reason fathers are not to teach their sons Greek, what about fathers teaching their daughters Greek? This is a logic driving Abba Hu, who adds that Greek is an ornament, adornment. To counter Abba Hu, Rabbi Shimon does not question either the proposal or the idea of Greek as a feminine ornament. Instead, he claims that Abba Hu ascribed his own desire to teach his daughters Greek to the venerable Yohanan, an insinuation hotly denied. No biblical allusions are advanced to support the objection to this form of transmitting knowledge. Another rabbi knows of a different dictum connected with Yohanan, namely the fear that the knowledge of Greek can, bring, can breed betrayal. We may pause for a second to consider what is meant by Greek and for what purpose besides the one linked with class and connections, would it be an embellishment for young ladies? Perhaps the reiteration of Abahu's proposal in a tractor devoted to the Sabbath contains a clue. And here is what it says. One may not look at a mirror on the Sabbath. If it was fixed on a wall, Rabbi, Rabbi permits, but the sages prohibits. Rabbi Aha, in the name of Rabbi Abba, said, the reason to forbid is that if a woman looking at a mirror on the Sabbath spots a single white hair, she will tear it out, and hence it would be liable to sin offering, in other words, violation. A man is forbidden to look into a mirror even on weekdays because it is dishonorable. Three things were permitted to the house of Rabbi that they can look at the mirror, that they can get a Greek style haircut, and that they can teach their sons Greek because they have dealings with the government. Rabbi Abahu said in the name of Yohanan, a man may teach his daughter Greek because it is an ornament to her. This is the second time it's mentioned. When Shimon heard it, it said, Abahu himself desires to teach his daughters Greek. He attributes the saying to Yohanan. When Rabbi Abahu heard, he said, I'll be cursed if I lied. So according to the rabbis, women are, in, in, women are vain, so much so that they will even risk violating the Sabbath, albeit unthinkingly. In this context, girls boasting Greek would constitute a vain advantage. Rather than becoming an adornment, as Abba Hu had maintained, 
possessing Greek is subtly compared to violating the Sabbath by wearing jewelry. The term used for jewelry is precisely the one that Abahu used to describe the advantage of paternal transmission of Greeks to daughters. Abahu proposal not only assumes the educability of girls, since the acquisition of a language like Greek was no mean achievement, as I know when I learned Greek, but also that the knowledge of Greek is useful to girls as it is useful to sons of the patriarchal family. Contrasting sons with daughters and the selective acquisition of Greek by sons of the Jewish aristocracy, the text reflect rabbinic consents regarding the necessity of Greek in certain circles. For girls, however, Greek would be as otios as Torah, in other words, a waste of time. How realistic was the rabbinic censure of the transmission of Torah and Greek from fathers to daughters? Greek was practiced throughout Palestine. Not only the upper classes, but also the rabbis were well versed in Greek. If Abahu's idea was confined to daughters of urban rabbis like himself, who were clearly well versed in rabbi in Greek, why did Shimon oppose it? Such an opposition would have been as otios as its target. Conversely, if Abahu's intention had been to extend paternal instruction to girls throughout Jewish society, it implied an underlying assumption of the capacity of Jewish fathers to teach Greek in general. This too may appear aspirational rather than actual. So in conclusion, adultery, at least on the part of married women, had been considered a crime in practically every ancient context. The Hebrew Bible establishes a procedure to detect adultery. When a husband is plagued or inspired, by a spirit of jealousy. The issue at stake clearly was the absence of evidence short of extorting confession from the woman. This is why the ordeal of the bitter water was established. Perhaps in its Mishnaic garb, the ordeal was a literary exercise of rabbi's solicitors to prevent even preliminaries like seduction. Perhaps the detailed description of the grim ritual and its chilling aftermath was calculated to induce a powerful deterrent. We cannot assume that the ritual and its extraordinary rabbinic elaboration circulated among women to be transmitted from one female generation to another. A story about Rabbi Meir, uh, who was married to a notable woman scholar uh, and who was willing to subject himself to ridicule in public in order to protect an innocent woman who was accused of adultery uh, illustrates the point. Um, I detect two strategies of defying the extension of education to daughters. To thwart the suggestion of teaching Torah, the rabbis resorted to shaming both daughters' aspirations to equal sons and fathers whom they deemed to step out of line with rabbinic rules. Shaming has been extensively debated recently, particularly in the context of social media. The theory of shaming is based on shared social context in which were, act, were, acts, which were acts as means of enforcing the values that are operative in a given society. In rabbinic eyes, the proposal to teach daughters Torah violated an operative standard applicable to all members of the rabbinic class. It also constituted a moral transgression promoting the notion that teaching daughters Torah is tantamount to encouraging female depravity. The reaction of mocking functioned as a culturally sanctioned fashion both then and now. Abahu's idea of teaching daughters Greek was attacked from a different angle. To begin with, a precedence of teaching sons Greek was known, debated and approved in the case of male scions of the house of the Jewish patriarch. But the approval stopped short of inclusion of all members of the clan, regardless of their sex. Yet the issue of languages in Roman Palestine, and specifically in Jewish circles, raised the question in what languages should one speak at home with one's children. Emphasis was placed on the transmission of language of holiness, Hebrew from fathers to son. The Torah itself, the rabbi's claim, was revealed in four languages, Hebrew, what they call Roman, Latin, Aramaic, and Arabic, not to mention references to inscribing the Bible in 70 languages. Notwithstanding, there is hardly a doubt that the default language was Hebrew. 
precisely because Greek dominated the Palestinian environment in which the rabbis formulated their ideas. The shaming tactic here is personal, accusing Abahu of presenting faulty, if not false credentials to account for his proposal. Greek itself is not dismissed, only the credibility of the proposer. Sequestering girls by barring them from both Torah, namely inner Jewish communication circles, and Greek, namely a link with external environments, also entailed familial detachment between fathers and daughters. The possibilities of intergenerational transmission of foundational religious text and its sanctified language were close to girls. We do not possess the voice of the excluded. Still, the dissenting voices occasionally voiced by eminent rabbis point to a certain fluidity of rabbinic culture that is useful for a broader understanding of the transmission of religious knowledge in an increasingly diversified society. Both Torah and Greek, it is implied, could be taught at home by fathers, an agency that would have transformed domestic spaces into learning spaces for girls. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh... Um, a lecture in on all counts. It's um, a very interesting sort of um, story and material that we should probably be exposed more to uh, in time. I will invite now questions. I'm sure people would have comments. Uh, but, but and... I, apo I apologize. I probably should have circulated the um, the, the lecture before. Um, it's it's uh, it may may have been useful, um, especially for those who have not had a chance to tackle um, Arabic texts, which are, are pretty. Uh, they're not so complicated as there is a certain there are certain strategies of reading them, which obviously are taught. Um, and I'm sure that those who were in the circle of um, Nicolas Delange or um, Talila and so forth are, are certainly familiar with. So I'm I'm sorry I apologize for for not but some of these points would have been familiar. Tali Lan, for example, um, did write a short article. I don't remember if it's in English or Hebrew, um, dealing with some of the points that are actually raised as well. So, um, um, and of course, the whole question of education, um, to, uh, of, of the education of women in antiquity is, is another question. Um, we tend to be dependent on on exceptional cases, but uh, we forget that the vast majority did not belong to the imperial court or uh, did not belong to the upper crust of society. I mean, it, whenever we talk about uh, especially early Christianity or Christianity of late antiquity, we always, you know, the, the circle of Jerome, uh, we obviously uh, introduced to an extraordinary degree of literacy on the part of women, but they're all uh, obviously belonging to a very thin crust of um, society. Um, um, which is obviously extremely interesting because they did have the advantage of having accessible, uh, uh, an accessible education. So this, this is something, I mean, we don't have comparable works written by Jewish women, unfortunately. Um, works that could compare with the Kento Probae, the, uh, the poem that, <laughs> The, the Virgilian poem that recast, uh, obviously, the, the, the Bible, which uh, Proba wrote. So we don't have it. That, um, the ability to compare uh, the literacy of even well-educated Jewish uh, women in antiquity. We can only speculate. Sabrina, you please. Thank you very much for this very interesting conference. Um, I have two questions. The first one, maybe you said it and I missed it. What was the Hebrew word used for the uh, adornment by Rabbi, Rabbi Abahu? Uh, kishut, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. And my second question, obviously it's a little bit far-fetched, but um, and I'm a little obsessed by my own research. So um, I was wondering to what extent is it is possible? Where did this... Um, is there any evidence for the origin of Rabbi Abahu's uh, idea to teach a girl Greek. And I was uh, wondering if, of course, it's a little bit far, but because we have evidence that there are some kinds of literary um, relations between um, 
rabbis in particular, if I remember correctly, Rabbi Abau and the Caesarean Christian community at that time. If I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Abau, he's contemporary with Pamphilus, end of the third, beginning of the fourth century. Right, exactly. So Pamphilus, we are told, um, gave importance to uh, produce Bibles and to spread the Bibles amongst people, you know, in, um, especially people who are not rich. And it is said that he, he gave them away, he made copies and he gave them, them away to men, but also to women if they had an inclination to, uh, to read. So I was wondering to what extent this uh, idea of Rabbi Abahu somehow could be related to what the Christians do in Caesarea, if that is really too far-fetched, I don't know. Oh, I think, I think it's a great point. Um, because there, there's been a, a great deal of talking about the Caesarean context, you know, the, the fact that, that, that he lived in Caesarea. But um, that partic this particular kind of context, in other words, uh, intellectual, uh, exegetical, if you want, um, uh, uh, connections, uh, apparently remain uh, hypothetical at this point. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, well, it, 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 and unfortunately, uh, there, there are no reference. Like Jerome, of course, refers to to the persons who from whom he learned Hebrew. So it's a little bit more specific. Even though I'm almost annoyed because Jerome never stopped writing, and yet his references to his, you know, connection with Jews are so limited that you, yeah, you may write articles and articles and articles, but they basically revolve around the exact same little citation from Jerome. And and with Abahu, it's also. Um, all the, the, the you know the assumptions. For example, there has been a widespread assumption that he was very close to the um, governmental classes yeah. in Caesarea, to the governor and so forth and so on. Um, that he was highly respected, not only close but highly respected. But an, an article not long ago by Jeffrey Herman showed, and I think correctly, that all these assumptions are confined to the Babylonian Talmud, not to the Palestinian Talmud. So, in other words. Contemporary or near contemporary Palestinian sources do not refer to this particular status, I should say, of, of Abahu. Um, but I would love to, 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 to speculate about connections between Pamphilius and, 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 I mean, the Library of Caesarea. I mean, one wonder whether Abahu actually ever went to the library. Hey, rabbis are supposed to. This is another question. Do rabbis actually go to libraries? Judging by contemporary uh, rabbis, they have very limited library. If you've ever looked at, and if you if you ever see photographs of rabbinic homes or, or Haredi homes, very very religious, it's the same volumes. They are the same size, the same color. The library is extraordinarily similar in every Haredi yeah. house, and it's absolutely limited. Um, and and so I and so I wonder whether we don't know anything about rabbinic libraries in antiquity. Absolutely nothing. About yeah, the bibliographic uh, their biblia bibliographic input seems to be very limited. In fact, yeah, yeah, and and quite frankly, the the um, the major work was solely Bomani. That was ages ago. I don't think that since then, since then, you know, scholars kind of how should I say became more sophisticated. But the basic groundwork of all the sources and all the hints that talk about Greek culture in Palestine, particularly rabbinic Greek culture, they were all collected by Saul Lieberman, and mm -hmm. that I'm talking about literally ages ago. <laughs> um, so I don't recall, um, if, I were to, if I were to look, I would see if, you know, if, he, if he refers to, to Pophilius. Um, and the other thing is that I don't think Eusebius knew Hebrew, I'm not sure. Oh, well, he did not. He right, did. right. And that is yeah, interesting. Yeah, scholars are just uh, frustrated that they want to have that connection because it seems so close and at the same time so far away. But um, if the libraries of the rabbis were really small, you know, I think the, li the Christian library of Caesarea was not as big as uh, people think it was. So uh, uh, probably, also, uh, probably. Um, it, you know, there's been a lot of recent research on libraries, which were mostly private in late antiquity. But I don't recall of uh, anybody talking about the size. I mean, I mean, I'm sure they did, but I don't remember offhand people talking about um, about the size of such libraries. I mean, we certainly know that um, we have uh, in the exchange of letters, they all they're very often, and and Jerome knows that in in for example in, in Gaul in Gallia, um, we have we have letters that constantly refer to 
scribes copying and oh my god you just i just borrowed a copy from you you want it back hang on a minute let me just copy that so we know that people actually copied and copied and copied and basically for their own private libraries so we know that that was part of being an aristocrat now unfortunately it's not but in in in, in antiquity you, you showed your not just your money and worth but you also showed that you're sort of learned um mm -hmm. Library of Caesarea, it's all speculations. Uh, but judging by the scholarship of, of Eusebius, it would have been fairly substantial. Plus, of course, he was in Constantinople. Well, we don't know if it, you know, he, he, he certainly cites a lot of things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, neither that he knew it firsthand, nor that he owned it. So uh, I think it's right. difficult to really be certain about what he did and what he did not have. But that's another question, of course. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. So there is something for you to, to um, research as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I believe Georgia has a question. Yes, I do. Uh, first, thank you very much. Uh, it was really, really informative. Um, I have a question that comes out of ignorance and somehow builds upon um, the previous question, because uh, I would like to ask you if you can expand on one point, and that is whether we find any uh, sort of say reflection on the danger of Greek literature in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that is, I'm asking you from different perspective because sometimes in Syriac literature, um, it appears that learning Greek is discouraged, not just for the, so to say, because they are the enemy in a political, so to say way, but just for, for the access that it would open to a different kind of literature. So I was wondering if we have something similar, what is, a different, completely different um, mind setting. That's a really, really uh, a great point. Uh, because of, co of course, Greek as such was not just a language. It, it reflected the whole traditional idea and, and a whole, a whole, a whole uh, different tradition. So that it, it, it's, 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 it's quite obvious. But, but you do find, for example, um, in um, the cemetery of Beit Arim, which is certainly a Jewish cemetery uh, in, in ancient Palestine, um, it, you find that there are few inscriptions that clearly echo um, that are in Greek and they clearly echo, I would say, Homeric verses. Um, so that would have been part of, of Greek learning. Um, the problem with that is that I don't know of any rabbinic text that actually says, okay, this is what learning Greek is about. You start with Homer and you know you do that and you do that. We do, I don't think, I don't recall um, that any such text exists. In other words, if you want a curriculum, um, like, but the point is that in spite of the fact that the rabbis create a world unto itself, Jews did not live in a vacuum in Palestine. There were other people. And, and, and the question of communication would have been, of course, Greek. So perhaps the question is also um, what level of Greek? Because, you know, take, take for example, um, uh, traveling with English, you can travel around the world, and because just about everywhere, people would have rudimentary English. So you may not be able to discuss uh, biblical exegesis if you go to, no, I don't know, but you can certainly manage to find your way around. Um, so, so it's not only the, the question of language, it's also the question of the proficiency, to what extent you, you, you can. And that's where we don't have a sense, because we are confined essentially to written sources. Unless we have you know, connection with the other world, we don't, what we have is essentially what people took the trouble to write down and also what survived. And a lot of stuff did not survive. Um, and, and so I would be very curious, to, for example, to know whether Christian pilgrims, and not only to the Holy Land, also to other places, whether they actually left diaries, whether they wrote back, like Egeria, whether they wrote back letters describing what they saw. Um, so what we have is we have a huge number of different genres, especially in late antiquity. And, and I would hazard a guess that something like the miracula genre, in other words, the recital of miracles, would be what I would call a popular genre, um, and perhaps even written in a quote unquote more popular language if you want, not the, not for the sort of the, the high class. Sermons would also use probably a little bit of a different language. Um, but we are, 
you know, the spoken language, we can only guess what it was. We don't, we don't actually uh, know. What is interesting, of course, about the, the rabbinic lit corpus as, as such, it's not only very large, it is probably the most interesting expression of a minority in antiquity. In other words, I do not know of any other minority in the entire history of antiquity, and I'm talking, say, from you know, the, the first dynasty of Egypt to late antiquity that um, uh, took so much trouble in writing down um, whatever it is, whether it's history, whether it's concocted history, whether the rules, I just don't know. Even within late antiquity, the corpus of, of rabbinic writings is, is enormous. I mean, every, everything else was written by a majority or a winning majority, you know, Christians, obviously, uh, a winning majority. So I think that there's something very curious there about the, the, um, the place not only of Jews in late ancient Mediterranean, but in that rabbinic mentality of writing, writing, writing. I mean, obviously what we have is, 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 is not authentically uh, late, late, late ending, but the whole idea of, of, of writing and, and basically everything is actually biblical exegesis. I mean, it's not as though they wrote uh, pilgrimage diaries. It's not as though um, they wrote uh, history in, 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 in the style of Amiamus Marcellinus. Unfortunately, they, they didn't, or, or even Josephus Flavius, but it's all based on the Bible. So it's essentially the Bible updated and updated and re-updated and re-updated and re-updated and, and I think so. Um, now, who read that? I don't know. Uh, it was mostly transmitted orally, but who went to all these sermons and lectures? We do have some evidence for that. Um, we even have evidence to women of women attending some of these rabbinic sermons um, as well. Uh, but to what extent they were really welcome, I don't know, and I kind of doubt it. So, um, but, <laughs> thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, Marie Lor, would you like to comment on the epitaph of Eustace a bit before we go to David? Mm, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, Please. it's just because uh, Professor Sivan to uh, told us about um, a Homeric quotes in mm -hmm. epitaphs. I think it was Homeric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this epitaph, specific epitaph of young Justus. Uh, so basically, we don't know whether he was a child or maybe more a young man, but they are like uh, direct uh, direct quotes from uh, the Iliad, for instance. So yeah, so I refer to the number in the corpus by uh, Moshe Schwabe uh, and Baruch Lefschitz. Right. That's yeah. that's yeah. That's in the in the in the volume that they published on the excavations of Beche Arim. Um, yeah, um, you know the people who were buried there were not necessarily local, so there would have been um, Jews from the diaspora uh, and which, which who did what what rich Jews do now. They live somewhere and then they're rich enough to order that when they die, they should be buried in in the Holy Land. And 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 so the we, it's very difficult to to figure out if their if their uh, prefer, preference for Greek was in a, in a sense uh, was bred on Palestinian territory or whether the whether the body came from you know um, who knows where and um, the assumption now by the way is that the Jewish diaspora spoke the language of the diaspora. Um, the, um, I'm working on the North African one, which is a very interesting example that there's a lot of literature, mostly in French, of course, um, and very little information. <laughs> so um, the, there are very few inscriptions that can be identified as Jewish inscription from North Africa. There are about 70. Does anybody know how many inscriptions roughly uh, are, came from North Africa in antiquity? How many inscriptions do we have from North Africa, roughly? We have more inscriptions from North Africa in antiquity than from any other provinces of the Roman Empire, about 60,000. So whenever, Jews, whenever people talk about big Jewish communities in North Africa and inscriptions, I, I happen to become very irritated because I say, you know, there's 60, maybe 70 inscriptions, but there are 60,000 inscriptions from North Africa. So. It's not, not exactly the same. So in, in the, you know, there's now a series of publications finally of all the inscriptions from um, uh, Palestine, you know, there's a whole corpus. 
and and I'm sure that they will update those from Beit She'arim uh, as well. Um, so when you do your work, do me a favor and look again at the inscriptions from North Africa, and uh, you can tell us whether you think that they're Jewish or not, and if they are, how do they fit into the epigraphical habit, if you want, of the of Jews in late antiquity. That will be very useful. I will be looking forward to your publication on, on that, yes. <laughs> um, I've, I've been working on other things from North Africa, which, which has been a surprise for me, but um, oil lamps um, they, that um, I claim they're Jewish. Whether they're Jewish or not, I don't know. But um, they're very unusual and they're very interesting. And, and they may be, uh, they, they seem to be Cartaginian. Um, so we'll see. But good luck with all the inscriptions because it's really very useful to look at them again. And um, I think there are a couple of children too there. But I'm not really sure. So thanks very much. I believe David has a question. Please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is a fascinating topic. Uh, and, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Hagit, for um, for sharing uh, your work with us. Um, this is my first time here. Uh, and if some of my question uh, seems a little bit far from the, the, the mean, um, it's just because I, I, I teach Semitic uh, languages um, such as Aramaic and, and Hebrew, uh, but my primary research is in Arabic. And I'm, uh, I'm actually writing about an Arabic woman logician from the Sahara Desert in the early modern period. Um, and one of the things I've been trying to find are uh, women logicians or women writers in sort of intellectual history uh, writ broadly um, when these first appear. Um, and so I guess my, my first question uh, would just be about um, the, um, the earliest extant writings um, by Jewish women in any language. Uh, um, that would be the first question. And the second would be just a comment very quickly about uh, a question that arose a little bit earlier. Um, Gonzalo de Berceo, um, who has one of the earliest uh, works in something resembling uh, Spanish, his Milagros de Nuestra Señora, uh, which is in a, a, a sort of low register language for popular consumption, um, definitely it's, you know, it's about Mirabilia um, and certainly refers to um, Byzantine uh, material related to pilgrimage, and that's in northern Spain, I think in the 13th century, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there are certainly Byzantine pilgrimage accounts, I think as early as the fourth century, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, correct, correct. Uh, uh, but I'm, I, I'm not knowledgeable about those. My real question is simply um, about earliest uh, Jewish women's writing. Um, uh, specifically in sort of the Jewish intellectual heritage in any language or, or period, if, if you know anything about this. Thank well, you. your, thank you. Well, your reference to female magicians or sorceress or whatever they call them, I thought you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, always reminds me of the uh, dictum of Ben Sira, which the rabbis adopt, and that saying that um, any man who has a daughter has trouble. When she's small, he's worried, you know, that she she's not you know, sort of look, she doesn't look at, at boys and things like that. When she's a teenager, he worries less she doesn't find a husband. When she's married, he worries that she doesn't have sons. And when she gets old, he's worried if in case she becomes a witch. So <laughs> so you have Already, you know, in a sense, a, a female witches have been, were uh, very much, a, a, I think, a, a part of folklore from the earliest antiquity. And, and, and already sort of Ben Sira, who's probably second century, if not earlier, BC, 
um, already alludes to the fear that in the old age, women can become witches. Um, as to uh, literate women, well, this is a phenomenon which starts, in, well, obviously, throughout antiquity, you know, from Sappho onward, you have women who, who were writers. Uh, Christianity certainly seems seem to have bred uh, female pilgrims, and the most famous one is Egeria, who you're absolutely correct, about 380, she um, embarked on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and she left us um, a pretty comprehensive uh, diary. You also have women who um, wrote letters or received letters and so forth. The earliest Jewish women, they may have come from the Geniza, but this is a later, this is about 10th to 13th century collection, but the Geniza has 300,000 fragments. And I don't know uh, many people went through the 300,000 fragments, but I won't be surprised if you uh, Google Geniza and uh, women writers or women literacy, you may find some uh, information. I'm more worried about the gap between late antiquity and the 10th century. I mean, what actually happened in the 500 years that Christianity, Islam, and Judaism uh, seem to have lived side by side, um, and we don't really have uh, many sources, list of all of um, women writers. And the other thing is that how do you identify the writing of women? Is it likely that we do have some writings, but those women, like Jean Sand, in other words, they wrote under a male's name. So I think it would be interesting to ask, how do we really identify? And I may ask students, I may bring texts, and I may ask students, do you think this text was written by a man or by a woman? And if so, why? Why do you think it was written by a man? Why do you think it was written by, by a woman? And I may take, um, again, a, a page of pilgrimage from a diary of pilgrimage or, or something like this um, and ask, who do you think wrote it? Uh, just out of curiosity, so that maybe um, to, to introduce a little bit of a sense to the gender behind the writing, um, because there's a lot of discussions now, you know, do, is there... Is there a distinct feminine writing? Is there a distinct male writing? Um, in other words, can you can you think of a male who writes like a Margaret Atwood, for example, or um, a man who could write like Simone de Beauvoir, or a woman who could write like you know uh, Stephen King, <laughs> or something like this? <laughs> I don't know, but I think it would be fun to start with contemporary writers without giving the name and say, okay. Let's try to identify, like bring uh, detective novels, which I love. So take a couple of pages from several uh, writers and say, okay, is it like a man or a woman? And and it will be, and, and it's a nice way to to develop sensitivity to 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 the gender of writing. Um, and as somebody who loves detective fiction, <laughs> I, I I really wonder whether. Um, you, you know, whether people who write, who read Agatha Christie can actually tell that it's a woman writer. Um, but as far as, and again, Jewish women, do they write like Jewish or do they write like women? Uh, Christian women, do they write as Christian or do they write as women? Uh, same thing for Islamic women and, and, and so forth. And uh, I mean, my gut feeling is that women always wrote. It's just that nobody bothered to, to preserve it. And, and and so we are left with a lot of uh, guesses, but you know, little by little we may discover things, who knows? Um, but I think it's good questions to ask. Uh, can, we tell the, the, can we tell the gender? Can we tell the religious convictions? Can we tell other convictions of somebody who writes? Um, and not necessarily pamphlets, but somebody who writes fiction or, or something like that. I would probably do that also with books or articles written by colleagues. <laughs> I will take articles written, I don't know, about the Hadith, and I will ask students whether they think this particular article is written by a man or a woman, or by um, you know, somebody who comes from British tradition of scholarship, or American tradition of scholarship, or German tradition of scholarship. You will find that you can always tell German tradition of scholarship. <laughs> so it could be kind of fun. So thanks a lot for asking. Thank you, Amari Love. I think it's the last question, but yeah. so Please. I think it's because you uh, you mentioned at some point epitaphs for children in North Africa. 
and I think they are, I don't remember because okay. the inscriptions I and found them not very useful for my purpose. Yeah. Okay, but how many? Not uh, they, they were all collected in an article by Le Boeck, and I can you know can send you the reference if you want. Um, it's it's I, I think yes there are a couple of children and in fact I still collect references on children. I've just bumped into something uh, the other day and so. Um, um, so why would you email me to, to, to write to me exactly about what you're researching and when I find things I can send you the information okay. and I can send you the information about uh, North Africa um, as well and, and, and so uh, yeah that would be fun. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you thanks for everybody. the presentation. Well thank you. Thanks okay. everybody. Thank you for putting up with this Zoom and with all the drilling that goes around. Did you hear the siren? There was also a siren. Uh, there but as i said no we're not being bombed we're just you know sitting in the peace and quiet um and i really appreciate thank you so much um attending uh my lecture and hopefully one day we can all sit around the same table and, be and lovely. we can all mm -hmm. not not just talk to me but but talk around the table which is really what i miss when we do the zoom because it's only you know two but it would be extremely interesting because i still would love to hear more about your work everybody's welcome. So, thank you. Really appreciate thank you. it. Before thank we you. send off, I believe um, Sabrina has a last question. Ah, great. <laughs> I don't want to see anyone. I was just thinking, you know, while I was uh, writing this pr project proposal about uh, handwriting and scribes and stuff, I came across this reference, if I'm not mistaken, if I didn't dream about that someplace, about women teaching scribes? Yes. Yeah. Correct, correct. There are there is there is there is or are references to female scribes, correct. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And also women teaching children. Yes, there are. They cannot be taught. <laughs> and I think I think I I'll have to 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 I think I think I mentioned it in the book on childhood. Mm -hmm. so something like this, yeah. I think I did, I'm not sure. But yes, there are. And and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, apparently. I mean, and 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 basically, I'm not surprised because ch little children basically, you know, need a just introduction to the to the alphabet. And I think we do have. I didn't have a chance to mention, but there is a spectacular series of mosaics, which uh, focus on a little boy called Kimbros, um, and they were published, and you can actually look them online. If if you do Kimbros mosaics, you will find. And in one of these mosaics, you see three little children who are apparently not apparently being taught by a teacher because the teacher stands on the side. There are two boys and one girl, and they're actually identified by name. I think the girl is Theodoria, Theodora or Theodosia, something like this. And so if you Google Kimbros, K-I-M-B-R-O-S. Now, there is a slight possibility that Kimbros was Jewish. No, no. I would like that possibility. Um, yeah. Nice. But um, but the settler is a little girl there, uh, and and they all sit on the little bench, and they are and the teacher is next to them. Mm -hmm. So it looks as though, frankly, in in in, in rich houses, uh, just like in rich Roman houses, girls were educated as and and that was the real distinction, not just the money, but education. And and it's absolutely true because throughout history until the 20th century, educated women also meant rich. Women, in other words, women belonging to rich houses, because you could. It's and that's the greatness of the 20th century that most of us, if we were born, it, and then I just had a discussion with a with a friend the other day, uh, and if we were born in the 19th century, or, or he said something like, "Would you like to be born in the 16th century?" I said, "No." <laughs> he said, "Why?" Like Renaissance. Said, no, because in the 16th century, and unless you were a member of a very very wealthy a clan, very, very, very big family, you really had two options. Do you know what they were? You could either become a governess, in other words, you know, in a rich house, or I'm afraid to say prostitute. These were the options, yes. In other words, working women. And, and of course, women, as, as you know, there's been a lot of research in working women in Roman history. And yes, you find that they did other things because we have the Egyptian contracts and we have a lot of information from Egypt. But the overall, this distinction has not really disappeared, you know, all throughout history. So I'm very glad that I didn't have to become one or the other. 
So <laughs> that I could get university education and that we can all the optimistic views of the, the period we live in. <laughs> we hear only the negative all the time. Thank you yeah, very so much. We are, we are lucky to, to be born when we were you when we were born. Yes, certainly so. So have a wonderful evening wherever you are. And if you're driving, be careful. If you're walking, have fun because that's a lovely time to walk. And uh, instead of saying next time in Jerusalem, as they say, maybe we should say next time in Ghent and around one table. Nice. <laughs> around one lovely. table. Thank you <laughs> very much. Around millions of tables, yes. Thank you <laughs> well, very much. Thank you so much. Thank, really you, thank you a lot. Thank Take you. care. All thank the best. You. Bye bye. Thank Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day, yeah? <laughs>